perspectives on Japanese foreign policy in East Asia. I think we are very honored to have two uh, very distinguished professors from Japan, from Seiyo University, for both political <coughs> scientists, but who will make presentations on two different topics today. One is about the um, Korean the Peninsula and Japan's uh, policies towards uh, what is happening on the Korean Peninsula. Professor Nishino will start in a, in a minute. And, um, and after that, uh, Professor Kamu will talk about uh, Japan's uh, China policy. So we are very excited having your perspective on, uh, on Japan's policies in these two critical arenas. I'd also like to thank the uh, Japanese Embassy for, uh, for facilitating this, uh, this uh, event. We are, we are very happy uh, that we can collaborate in this way. And uh, the way we are going to go about it is that um, first we'll have the two presentations, and then we'll have comments from Andreas uh, Boy Forstby, and maybe you'll just say a few words about yourself. Yeah, so I'm a uh, researcher at the Nord Institute of uh, Asian Studies. Uh, I specialize mainly on uh, Asian security dynamics. Uh, so I'm looking forward to having a chance to come to your presentations. And uh, I'm a professor of China Studies uh, at the Department of Cross-Cultural and Regional Studies at the University of Copenhagen. And I work on China politics. And right now I'm working on two different issues. One is uh, policy learning and policy translation in Chinese energy politics. And the other aspect is uh, the governance of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. But anyway, you are in focus. Uh, we are looking forward to your, your presentation. So please, and uh, there will be time for questions after I have asked his um, uh, comments. Mm -hmm. can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, just recording. Okay, okay, yeah. I make it louder. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, moderator. Uh, it's my great pleasure to have an opportunity to uh, present my view on uh, today. The, my topic is Japan security uh, policy challenges, uh, especially on the Korean Peninsula. So the first of all, uh, I want to extend my thanks to the University of obviously University of Copenhagen, and also the Japanese Embassy for the realizing and organizing this uh, seminar. So today I will uh, speak about Japan security and foreign policy challenges on the Korean Peninsula, as well as the recent uh, development on the Korean Peninsula uh, in about uh, 20 minutes. Uh, just started. Uh, so the, uh, in my presentation, I will mainly address uh, three things. Uh, first three, uh, I briefly touch up on the overview of the Japan's effort in dealing with North Korean nuclear issue. And the secondary, uh, then uh, effort, especially on defense side, uh, Japan and the United States and the South Korea trilateral uh, cooperation in dealing with the North Korean nuclear issue uh, will be addressed. And the thirdly, I will uh, elaborate uh, more on the Japan-South Korea bilateral uh, relationship. So we often say that the Japan-South Korea relations are the one of the important bilateral ties, but at the same time, uh, we often say that the weakest link of the trilateral cooperation among Japan, United States, and South Korea. And uh, now, uh, as you may know, this, this bilateral relationship, I mean tokyo Seoul tie, is experiencing a very difficult time. So the first, the Overview of the Japan's effort on the Korean Peninsula. I would say that Japan's uh, effort in dealing with North Korea uh, consists of three pillars. Number one, engagement policy. Number two, applying pressure. And uh, number three, defense and the deterrence against North Korea's military threat. So historically, the Japanese government has consistently tried to apply so-called engagement policy to North Korea. Uh, especially in September 2002, in the midst of the North Korean nuclear crisis, then Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi visited Pyongyang and signed a joint declaration with uh, former leader Kim Jong-il of North Korea. So at that time, Japan strongly hoped that Japan-North Korea diplomatic ties would be normalized, 
But uh, unfortunately, uh, North Korea's, in a way, insincere attitude about the abduction issue of the Japanese uh, nationals has made it impossible for Japan to move forward in its relationship with North Korea. Then the current Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe has also tried to make a breakthrough in the, in the abduction issue and uh, reached an agreement with North Korea in Stockholm in May 2014, uh, almost five years ago. The two sides agreed that North Korea launched the so-called Reinvestigation Committee on the Japanese nationals in North Korea. And uh, also North Korea promised that uh, it submit an investigation report to Japan. Uh, but uh, re very regrettably, North Korea has yet to submit any report uh, on this matter to Japan. So Japan has also tried to continue to solve the North Korean nuclear issue as a member of the Sixth Party Talks, which started in August 2003. And as you know, the, we reached a joint statement in the Sixth Party Talks in September 2005, which set the roadmap to denuclearize North Korea and also to establish a peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. So, but again, North Korea uh, breached this agreement and uh, has continued to develop its nuclear and the missile uh, program. So then North Korea uh, so far conducted nuclear tests six times since 2006. So given the rapid progress of North Korean nuclear and the missile programs and the repeated violation of the United Nations Security Council resolution, especially under the current leader Kim Jong-un regime, Japan has more effort, more, Japan has made more effort the strong pressure on North Korea. Important for Japan to enhance its defense and the deterrence capability against North Korea's military threat. So because North Korea has officially uh, stated repeatedly that its missile aim at Japan and actually uh, launched ballistic missile over the Japanese archipelago two years ago, recently. So to cope with the military threat from North Korea, Japan has developed its missile defense system together with the United States and revised Japan-US defense guideline three years ago in 2015 and also enacted new security legislation in 2016 not only to deter North Korea's military provocation, but also to prepare the, in a way, kind of the contingency scenario on the Korean Peninsula. So the meanwhile, uh, we've seen very dramatic uh, development move on the Korean Peninsula since the beginning of the last year. The chairman Kim Jong-un has repeatedly expressed his commitment to realize complete denuclearization of Korea. So the, from the Japanese perspective, diffusing the military tension on the Korean Peninsula definitely contributes to Japan's security. And I personally appreciate President Moon Jae-in of South Korea's initiative in this matter. But uh, the meaning of complete denuclearization of, com of the Korean Peninsula which uh, Chairman Kim repeatedly mentioned, has yet to be defined. So, and, uh, many, of, and many observers uh, recognition that uh, it would take long North Korea a considerable, considerable time, length of time, to dismantle its nuclear program, <coughs> even if uh, Kim Jong-un had strong resolution on this matter. So the current process, the, I would say, if destroyed prematurely without reaching our goal, would bring about the danger of allow, allowing North Korea to make their possession of nuclear uh, weapons as an accomplished fact. So the longer time elapses without completing North Korea's denuclearization, the more danger Japan will face eventually a nuclear of North Korea, never being free from the main source of ja Japan's uh, security anxiety. So actually, the, all of the action taken so far by the North Korea, uh, number one, 
the suspension of nuclear testing on the missile launch, and the number two, so destruction of the entrance of the Pungeri nuclear site, and the number three, the partial, dismant partial dismantlement of missile and the engine testing facilities in Tonjangri. So the, then North Korea has yet stopped producing nuclear materials, nor it has disposed of nuclear materials or nuclear warheads produced in the past. So above all, I would say it's necessary to immediately take actions for denuclearization against North Korea's nuclear development, uh, nuclear development, especially the past and the present. So otherwise, it's, it will be difficult to judge from Japanese perspective that uh, Japan's, our security environment has improved. So especially the failure of the second summit meeting between Kim and Trump in Hanoi. So North Korea uh, recently and reportedly reconstructing Tonchanri missile facilities. And uh, Chairman Kim's uh, will to denuclear the North Korea is becoming more unclear. So the, then to safeguard Japan's security, uh, Japan has to enhance and develop its defense capability more efficiently and effectively. So in this context, I would say trilateral security cooperation among Japan, US, and South Korea has been a very important policy instrument for Japan's security and foreign policy in dealing with North Korea. So Japan, the United States, and South Korea trilateral security cooperation has gradually but steadily developed, especially since the late 1990s. The, especially in December uh, 2014, uh, the four or five years ago, the Trilateral Military Information Sharing Agreement has finalized. And uh, this agreement has made it possible for three countries to work together more closely in dealing with North Korea's military provocation than before. So in, a, in accordance with this uh, trilateral information sharing agreement, Japan, United States, and South Korea conducted so-called Pacific Dragon Exercise, which is a trilateral ballistic missile uh, defense tracking event, and also conducted anti-submarine warfare exercise, given the North Korea's growing SLBM capability. So in order to further develop this trilateral cooperation, uh, Japan needs to improve the weakest link of this trilateral cooperation. Uh, that is to say, Japan-South Korea, a bilateral relationship. So to improve the Tokyo Seoul ties, uh, we have to address uh, mainly three challenges. Number one, uh, historical issue, history issue. And number two, a different perspective perspective, perception, and assessment on the regional geopolitical landscape, especially the view on rise of China. And uh, thirdly and finally, the diverging policy uh, towards North Korea between Tokyo and Seoul. So firstly, the lingering history uh, issue have always, uh, always had that very negative impact on Japan-South Korea relations. So we both, Tokyo and, uh, we both Tokyo and Seoul has made many efforts to realize so-called historical uh, reconciliation, but uh, uh, we've yet to see the final solution and the final uh, goal to realize the historical reconciliation. So the, uh, from my uh, analysis, at this point, South Korea's domestic situation has made it very difficult for us, Japan and South Korea, to move forward in our bilateral relationship. The against the backdrop of the impeachment of former President Park Geun-hye in March 2017, the current President Moon Jae-in wants to find another way to address history issue with Japan. So because many South Koreans recognize that former President Park Geun-hye uh, made a compromise with Japan on history issue without making 
effort to build the national consensus on this issue, history issue. And the second area of concern is the differing perspective between Japan and South Korea uh, on the rise of China, which has destabilized bilateral relationship between Tokyo and Seoul, and made cooperation uh, between Tokyo and Seoul on various issues in East Asia more difficult. Uh, frankly speaking, Japan views China as a military threat in part due to the Senkaku Island issue. While South Korean government and many South Koreans had seemingly begun to view Japan's security posture vis-a-vis -vis China as a destabilizing factor in East Asia. So historically, South Korea's fear has been that the power struggle between Japan and China would escalate into a regional conflict requiring Seoul's involvement. So the, for example, the Japan-South Korea joint opinion poll conducted by the Gendong NPO and the East Asian Institute last year asked a question on which country is most, imp which country is most important to the future of Japan or South Korea. So the answer is over 60% of Japanese respondents United States, but why South Koreans were evenly split between the US and China? Very interesting for me. So the different perce perception of the strategic environment have generated a serious divergence between Japanese and South Korean policy. The two countries are bounded by their alliance partnership with the United States. But I, I would say uh, their main preoccupation has been uh, are, are quite uh, distinct. So there is a widespread feeling among South Koreans that their country, South Korea, is caught between its largest trade partner, China, and its ally, United States. So and uh, South Korea's central, uh, South Korea's the the main concern for security policy continue to be the division of the Korean Peninsula. So these factors combine to make South Korea reluctant to be drawn into an overt balancing strategy against China. So on the other hand, I would say that Japanese readers and the policy makers tend to view the Korean Peninsula as a, in a way secondary concern compared with China, compared with China. So it is true that the North Korean missile test over Japanese archipelago uh, around Japan, and also issue of the Japanese citizen abducted by North Korea has been a prominent concern for us. But uh, there remains reluctance to recognize Korean Peninsula as a primary for the defense and the security of Japan. So rather, the Japanese policy makers tended to be, in a way, preoccupied with the impact of China's economic and the military power in East Asia. So in sum, the differing assessment of present and the future relationship, especially with China, are causing a divergence in the Japanese and the South Korean's security policy, and at the same time, encouraging the mutual distrust or mistrust between Tokyo and Seoul. So lastly, the, regarding the North Korean uh, issue, uh, there has been a convergence on North Korea policy between Japan and S South Korea over the past 10 years due to Pyongyang's nuclear and missile ambition. However, at this point, uh, I would say that divergence of uh, diplomatic approaches towards North Korea between especially the, our Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and uh, President Moon Jae-in of South Korea has made it difficult for both governments to work together uh, more closely. Uh, frankly speaking, there is the friction between South Korea's policy towards North Korea, which has emphasized 
dialogue and uh, in a way softer approach, in other words, moonshine policy toward North Korea to change North Korea's attitude. So while Japanese policies, which has advocated applying greater pressure North Korea to change North Korea's attitude. So this, in a way, this agreement may allow Pyongyang to take advantage of the gap to extract more concession in the current process on the Korean Peninsula. So obviously, uh, we Japan and South Korea need to narrow this uh, perception gap, not only on China, but also on North Korea. So besides the different perception uh, on China's presence and China's presence and the law on the Korean Peninsula have also in a way undermined our closer cooperation between the Tokyo and the Seoul. The, from the South Korean's perspective, China is a very important stakeholder in the future of the Korean Peninsula uh, because the China is an ally and a patron of North Korea. And more importantly, China is a signing country of, of the Korean War Armistice of 1953. So this means that the China's endorsement is uh, indispensable for Korea's unification, Korean Peninsula's reunification. So the, we have many uh, challenges and uh, to tackle these challenges, uh, I will say uh, some recommendation. Number one, the continuing so-called two-track policy, uh, which uh, try to compartmentalize history issue from other, are other areas of cooperation between Tokyo and Seoul. Number two, the narrowing perception gaps between Tokyo and Seoul, the, through, the active, through the active strategic dialogue between two countries. And finally, the, and hopefully, designing a long-term joint vision in East Asia between Tokyo and Seoul. So the first one, the continued two-track approach, uh, I would say that, uh, frankly speaking, uh, it's unrealistic to imagine that history issue uh, will disappear anytime soon. Since history issue recur as a result of the, in a way, crush of identity between the to two countries and take the form of identity politics between Japan and South Korea. So finding a solution, finding a solution to history issue uh, will take a long time uh, from my perspective. Then both leaders should compartmentalize history issue from other areas of cooperation. So this is first one as a prescription. And the number two, the, with regard to narrowing the gap between the Tokyo and the Seoul on perception and the policy towards China and North Korea, the encouraging strategic dialogue at the various level uh, will definitely contribute to fostering a relationship of mutual trust between Tokyo and the Seoul. Then two countries should attempt to share as many strategic goals as possible through this dialogue. And finally, uh, I personally hope that Japan and South Korea should make good a joint effort to share a single vision of common regional future. So as well established democracies in, in Asia, I believe that the two countries can jointly play central roles in the regional, in the region's peace and stability of East Asia. So the, it is true that now Tokyo-Seoul relationship is in a very serious trouble, and uh, it will take a long time to restore our trust relationship. But I can say that the constructive relationship between Tokyo and Seoul is in a way prerequisite, not only for Japan's security and the prosperity, but also for peace and the prosperity in Asia. So I stop here. Thank you for listening and uh, appreciate the comment and the question in the Q&A session. Thank you very much.
Oh, yes, yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tomoki Kamo, uh, same university from Keio University. I'm working on the contem contemporary Chinese politics, especially uh, it's, I'm, I have been interested in the Chinese Communist Party. But today, I would like to talk about Japan and China relations. Uh, it's a, it's a, I can say it's a present state of Japan and China relations. <clears throat> while, uh, while the United States and China have fallen into the uh, phase of the confrontation, but Japan and China re uh, relations are warming. So as you know, Premier Minister, Prime Minister Abe visited of official visit, visit uh, Beijing uh, last, uh, last year, no, October 2018. So in Japan, so many people believe that the deterioration of the China and the US relations has made Japan's Japan-China relations better. But from my point of view, I don't agree this, this, uh, how can I say, this point. So how can I say, from my point of view, there are four major factors that impact Japan and China relations. So today, I would like to share the viewpoint to understand Japan and China relations. <clears throat> so before discuss about four major factors, I would like to make sure about the current history of Japan and China relations. At first, first starting point is the July 2008. 2008 is a uh, it's very beautiful period. Have you ever heard the 2008 consensus, Japan and China? At the time, in, in July, President Hu Jintao visited Japan, and next month, in June, the two countries announced the agreement, agreement on the joint development between Japan and China in the East, East China Sea. But unfortunately, December 2008, China's coast, China's coast Guard suddenly started the intrusion of the territory, territorial waters of the Senkaku Islands. And 2012, in China, there are some occurred anti-Japanese de uh, demonstrations related to the Senkaku Islands. Since then, China and Japan relations worsened severely. But 2000, uh, November 2014, Prime Minister Abe visited China, Beijing, and me, uh, we have a summit meeting with uh, President Xi Jinping. And then to, uh, May 2017, Mr. Abe sent Nikai Toshihiro, he is a number two it's a leading figure of the Japan's Liberal Democratic Party. And he is, uh, he is a well-known pro-China politician. So to, to the Belt and Road Forum for, on the International Cooperation in Beijing. And May 2018, Premier Li Keqiang visited Japan. And October 2018, 
visited uh, Prime Minister Abe visited Beijing. So <clears throat> today uh, in this presentation, I would like to focus on the since 2014 to 2019. What happened in the last five years? So in this period, there are seven times summit meeting between two countries. It's uh, November 2014 and April 2015, September 16, uh, 2016, and next year uh, 2017 and November 2017 and September 2018 and finally 2000, uh, October 2018. So, and there is a, it's a picture of the two countries summit meeting. This is the, the China's newspaper, Chinese Day, Renmin Rilpo, they published the, this picture. In 2014, and uh, Mr. Abe and Xi Jinping, the, here. And next year, uh, here. And 2016, here. But no smile and no national flag. It's very, the, for example, this is Korean, uh, South Korean leaders. But there are two national flags. But Mr. Abe and Xi Jinping, there are no national flags. But, oh, oh, here. July 2017, we can see the national flag. <laughs> and November 2017, also can see. And uh, September 2018, also. And finally, <coughs> here. Oh, oops. Here, it's weird. You have a smile and national flag. So, from this point of view, it's uh, an important turning point is maybe 2017, because before 2017, it's a uh, 2016, no national flag, but 17, we can see the two country national flag. It's 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 most important turning point. To, uh, on the two countries. So, but problem is that, so what has changed China, China, Japan's China, China's policy? We have, uh, there are two dimensions uh, on the Japan and China relations. One is economic relations. Second one is the security problem. And first one, uh, economic issues, so especially BRI, to be honest, so far Japan has never officially announced its support, the BRI, uh, towards the B PRI. So we can say in the, in the economic relation point of view that we, we our country, uh, the China's, China's policy have never changed. And security issues also, and especially East China Sea, the problem, uh, the problem is, how can I say, problem li relating the order in the East China Sea uh, has not improved at all. So why the problem is the, why? Question is the why has the relations improved? From my point of view, the four major factors that impact Japan-China relations. Number one is domestic politics. The second is economy. The third is international environment. And fourth is public perception. Okay, the first one, domestic politics. An important condition for China to introduce friendly policy toward Japan was to have strong leader with the solid power base. So Xi's consolidations of power met that condition. At the same time, Japan, Japanese public would like to have a leader who can resist the challenges to Japan's security. At the same time, 
can stabilize and develop relations with China as an important neighbor. So Abe also has a solid power base. This is the domestic politics point. And second one is economy. Also from our point of view, China's deepening economic wars will push its leadership toward better relationship with Japan. For example, uh, last year, uh, it's May uh, 2018, uh, Premier Li Keqiang <coughs> visited Japan. After that, not small number of the China's provincial leaders visited Japan. From their point of view, more investment from Japan is necessary, and Japan investors are well, welcomed. And from Japan's point of view, also China is a very important economic partner. This figure is the shows uh, its uh, importance of Japan's agricultural product. It's very interesting. First, it's Hong Kong. Second, it's United States. Third one, it's the mainland China. The fourth is Taiwan. From this figure point of view, we can see, oh, Japan, China is the most important economic partner for Japan. And the fourth is the international environment. Uh, no, no, the third, the international environment. Of course, the United States has played an important role in the two countries' relations. But how can I say that proposing BRI, this, from Japanese point of view, this means that this means the swing, the China's diplomacy from America first to Russia first. So we can say that Chinese, Chinese diplomacy dramatically changed. It was 2014. So we can say it was the one of the factor in holding the first summit meeting with the Abe in November 20, uh, 2014. That is the, the third one. And the fourth is public perception. Chinese perception of Japan are changing. Chinese who had a good image of Japan, 5.2% in 2013, but in the 2018, the 42.2%. And Chinese who had bad image of Japan, in 2013, 98.2%. But 2018, it 40, declined the 42.2%. And Chinese tourists visiting Japan increased from the 1.3 million in 2013 to 7.4 million in 2017. In Japan, widely believe that China's tourists transmit to the Chinese public positive image of Japan, Japan society through the social network. But Japanese side, is Japanese perception of China are changing. We can say the good image of China in 2013 is 9.6%. And 2018, the only 31, 30, 30, 13.1%. Uh, and bad image of China in 2013, 93%. And 2018, only 86.3%. So the question is the reason for the Japanese negative image of China we can say two point one is China. Uh, it's a China often from Japanese point of view. China often intrude into the, our territorial waters. The second is the China's actions are against in international rules. So, oh yes, but we don't have enough time. So 
just skip that if you have some questions or I ask. But this is the uh, image towards other uh, adults, uh, Japan's Japanese point and China's point. Also, uh, how evaluate towards science Japanese relations. So, <coughs> my In this presentation, I would like to address the one thing. <coughs> Sino Japanese relations are, how can I say, really complicated. So, if we want to understand the Japan and China relations, so we have to pay attention to four factors. It's a domestic politics and economy and international environment and uh, public perception. From my point of view, it, uh, I think the domestic politics is very important factor. But I'm not sure, there in, uh, how can I say, it? there are so many point, uh, argument in this analysis. So, I, my presentation is stop here. So if some questions, I would like to discuss about this, this, this kind of the, this framework. Thank you so much. Okay, Professor and Ishino, if you please move up here. Please move up here. And then somebody in the studio? Studio, yes. Then, Jess, if you would please uh, make your comments, then we can have a discussion and questions afterwards. Yes, I'll be happy to. And, um, Thanks for giving me this opportunity to uh, comment on your presentations. They were very interesting and there were a lot of takeaways from them. And of course, I only have time to focus on a few of them. Um, so uh, here I go. Um, I think I will just start chronologically by uh, addressing your uh, presentation. Uh, and I think I will uh, take uh, as a starting point, the recent collapse of the uh, U.S.-North Korea summit in Hanoi, because I think uh, uh, the fact that no agreement was reached and it was a diplomatic failure in most respects, uh, it has much reduced the optimism on the Korean Peninsula. And I think it's important also to just uh, reflect a bit upon why they didn't reach any agreement and what the uh, implications that uh, has for future relations uh, and the nuclear issue on the Korean Peninsula. So, I mean, the, I think most would agree that there are several explanations at work here. Um, it could, of course, to begin with, start with, you know, addressing the amateurism of the Trump administration. Uh, you know, Trump putting too much faith in his own uh, ability to strike a deal uh, with his counterpart. Um, the, the, the fact that they didn't start by reaching a technical uh, agreement between delegations from the two countries ahead of the meeting, but you know, rather just going directly into the meeting, hoping that they would be able to make the necessary compromises and all that, that's also, uh, of course, part of the reason. And uh, another thing that is very important here uh, is, of course, that we have many hawkish uh, voices in the current Trump administration. I think most of us would agree that uh, National Security Advisor John Bolton would be one of those very hawkish uh, persons. Um, but also Mike Pompeo has uh, made some very critical uh, comments on, on North Korea's uh, nuclear weapons program in the past. And of course, Vice President Mike Pence. So all these hawks in the current Trump administration, of course, makes it difficult to reach any compromise, I would say. You could even argue that they didn't enter these negotiations in any good faith, uh, that they even presented some new US-based intelligence uh, evidence of uh, North Korea's nuclear weapons program that was 
that, that, that took the North Koreans by surprise and that certainly didn't create a more constructive uh, atmosphere for reaching a compromise at the summit. So there were a lot of things that I would say indicate that the, that the Trump administration didn't enter these negotiations in, a, in good faith. Um, but more importantly, I think the current deadlock uh, also reflects Washington's unwillingness to even uh, go into this tit-for-tat uh, approach that is necessary to reach a compromise with the North Korean side. Uh, it's still the CVID, the comprehensive, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization or nothing. That's still the basic approach of Washington and it really sets the bar high and makes it really difficult to reach any compromises and so uh, there will be no peace treaty, there will be no rolling back of sanctions and all that and of course it, it makes it difficult to, to go very far. Um, North Korea on the other hand of course explicitly made clear that they wanted a rollback of the sanctions regime, especially the past four and five rounds of sanctions, the, the ones that really have a crippling effect on the North Korean economy, the ones that target North Koreans' uh, export of coal, minerals, apparel, seafood, uh, even its, its uh, uh, workforce that they export, uh, you could say, uh, to do the dirty uh, work of other countries. Uh, the import restrictions on their own uh, ability to, to import uh, oil refined products and so on and so on. So um, North Korea's offer to, to, uh, to, um, to maybe uh, consider shutting down Yongbyon, the main nuclear facility in North Korea, really fell short of, of what the uh, Americans were, were expecting. Uh, so my questions uh, in relation to this would be how you see this uh, failure of the, of the Hanoi summit and uh, how the current uh, Abe government differs in its approach to the North Korean um, nuclear issue uh, from the Trump administration, if you could point these things out. I also want to talk a bit about North Korea being a de facto uh, nuclear weapons power, uh, having become part of that very exclusive nuclear power scope. I think we all uh, realize that they are a de facto nuclear power. They made the, uh, they held, they, they had a successful uh, nuclear weapons test in September 2017, the sixth, um, and it was at this, the proportion of a hydrogen bomb, uh, the biggest explosion, uh, nuclear explos explosion in the world for 25 years. They have stockpiled dozens of nuclear uh, warheads since then. Um, and they have also developed the necessary delivery systems, the sort of road mobile delivery systems that they can easily hide and that will make it virtually impossible for the, for the US side to, to target these, uh, nuclear, this nuclear capability with a preemptive strike if that was ever a serious plan from Pentagon. It seemed to be that the, the so-called bloody nose strike that they Pentagon have been discussing uh, openly or at least uh, sometimes more indirectly uh, via the press uh, a couple of times. Um, so my point here is that in addition to being a de facto nuclear uh, weapons power, uh, they are also never going to give up their nuclear weapons. And why is that? I mean, first of all, they have gone through so many hardships to develop these weapons over several generations. Uh, these weapons are a source of national pride to the, to the North Koreans and Kim Jong-un has explicitly, explicitly said in his New Year's Eve address, uh, it was not last time but the year before, that the, the mission is completed now and they are going to stick to these weapons. Um, more importantly, you could say it's uh, also a very critical security guarantee in a world where the Kim regime is still widely perceived as an international barrier. Uh, they don't have many friends around. They need the security guarantee. And you could also say that while the North Korean regime certainly doesn't tr trust the Trump administration to provide the security guarantee that could come in exchange of uh, uh, these nuclear weapons, I think the North Koreans would also not tr uh, trust the Chinese to provide such, uh, such security guarantees. I know they have this mutual defense treaty from 1961. Uh, but we don't even know for sure whether this defense treaty will be renegotiated when it's uh, actually running out of its course in 2021. Um, so there are a lot of open questions uh, for Pyongyang at least. Um, so I think the main question here is really how 
uh, North Korea will, uh, how we should handle the fact that, it, that North Korea is a de facto nuclear power. And, and uh, I mean, how we can prevent the North Korean from North Korean side from exporting these weapons to other states or the technology, even perhaps to terrorist organizations. That would be the main question from my perspective. And I wonder if you share these observations uh, on North Korea's nuclear weapons program. And I also wonder if maximum pressure, the, the, the existing strategy from the Trump administration, would be the best approach. I mean, it's virtually driving the North Korean side to the brink of uh, the desperation, and it may even push them to, you know, thinking in terms of exporting this technology to other states or organizations. I also wonder if you think the Japanese government might even use North Korea's nuclear capability as a pretext to develop its own capability, and uh, if that would actually fit very well into the current uh, military modernization of, uh, of uh, Japan that we are witnessing. And finally, if you see the Japanese government um, having any difficulties with the Trump administration, having stated several times that it's actually mostly focusing on the ICBMs, the intercontinental ballistic missiles, rather than all the delivery systems, the ones that could easily reach Japan, but uh, not reach uh, the US if they didn't have, have the ICBMs. So um, yeah, so those were my questions for you. And I think I'll just move on uh, to uh, your presentation. Uh, so, um, yeah, um, I think one thing that, that is very important here to start out with is that the territorial conflict uh, that the two countries, China and Japan, have in the East China Sea regarding Senkaku, the Io, uh, that's really the main souring point or contention point between the two countries. And um, my question really is, why did this long-standing territorial and maritime conflict suddenly become such a thorny issue uh, in uh, bilateral relations? And I, you could go back maybe to uh, September 2010 and the Coast Guard uh, incident, the Chinese fishing boat captain that was arrested, detained, and uh, after trying to ram the, the Japanese Coast Guard vessels uh, and, and um, I would say that, okay, after 10 days, the fishing boat captain was released. And actually, in the Chinese media, it was presented as a sort of uh, diplomatic victory. So it's not probably there we should look for when the relations really deteriorated. So we have to fast forward to September 2012. And we have to take a very serious look at the nationalization uh, of the Senkakus. Uh, I think that's really key to understanding what's going on. Uh, I think you ha you had an appendix uh, yourself. I don't, don't know if you ever m made it that far in your presentation, actually, but uh, I've seen it before. There's a clear spike in the number of Chinese incursions into uh, territorial, uh, the territorial waters of the Senkaku and the contiguous zone starting in September 12. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think uh, it very accurately reflects when things really started to deteriorate uh, between the two countries. Um, and I also think it's important here to say that the decision to nationalize these islands was in most uh, respects, at least as I see it, a unilateral decision and a revi re revisionist one as well, uh, as it single-handedly changed the status quo that both parties had abided to until then. Uh, I know that's controversial to say that, um, but uh, at least I want to push you a bit uh, f uh, with this perspective. So I'm wondering if the Japanese could have avoided this crisis. Was nationalization really the only option available at that time um, that the Japanese government could resort to? Was the purchase of the islands from the Kurihara family perhaps rather a deliberate act that was you know, well orchestrated from behind the scenes to actually change the status quo I mean, was it a pretext again to change the status quo? I'm wondering this, and I haven't had any good answers from any uh, Japanese uh, interlocutors I've ha uh, had the chance to talk to over the past year, so I'm really curious about that. Uh, and so how do you see this conflict being resolved? Will time eventually heal the wounds? Uh, or what can the Japanese government do to 
to find a constructive path forward. Um, and I also want to address one more thing, one last thing, uh, and then I will stop with my comments. Um, so I really agree that the United States, as you put on one of your slides, is key to uh, the Japanese-Chinese relationship. And your initial question was, how far is the warming of Sino-Japanese relations going? Uh, and I agree that uh, Abe's visit in October 2018 was very important. It was the first by a Japanese premier in uh, seven years, I believe. Uh, so that speaks volumes, of course. Um, October 2018 was also a very important uh, time in other respects because it was when Vice President of the United States, uh, Mike Pence, gave a speech at the Hudson Institute in which he it was a seminal speech in many ways. He really, uh, um, he was very clear in how he saw US-China relations developing in the next uh, years. And he was, it was very comprehensive and strongly worded criticism of China's behavior across so many different issues, political issues, economic issues, security issues, of course. It was very, very uh, thorough, uh, his criticism. There were actually no room for optimism, I would say. He ended up with saying something like, we'll not be intimidated, we will not stand down. I think that was uh, some very strong words. Um, and I would say before the speech he made, the jury was still out whether uh, US-Chinese relations would go in either direction. I mean, we got off to a very good start with the Ma'alako meeting between Trump and Xi, and uh, Trump also visited Beijing, and they talked about a very good personal chemistry between the two leaders. And even if we knew that there were a lot of hawks uh, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, Washington establishment, we still th might have thought that Trump would sort of uh, make this uh, relationship work despite uh, all these hawks, in especially Washington, as I see it. Um, so um, I think it's fair to say that the US-Chinese relationship has entered a phase of a full-blown strategic rivalry. Uh, and I think the main point here is that this strategic rivalry really affects US allies and partners in a very deep sense. For instance, uh, Washington is openly uh, warning its partners to uh, not, um, you know, uh, have any cooperation going on with Huawei. Uh, we just saw in Denmark this uh, week, uh, I think maybe it was Sunday, that, that our main uh, mobile operator, uh, mobile networks operator, TDC, decided to, to uh, uh, terminate their existing cooperation with the Huawei. Uh, and we also know that the Danish government had been making the exact same advice uh, Sometimes very publicly, Klaus Scholz, our Minister of Defense, had made several points that would, uh, you know, put a lot of pressure on TDC in making this and coming up with this decision. We also know that the Japanese government has effectively uh, prevented uh, Huawei and ZDE from uh, being part of the of the critical uh, IT infrastructure of Japan uh, over the next uh, decades. Another example here is that. Washington is also discouraging its partners from uh, being, a pa being, being a part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, uh, just this, uh, a few weeks ago, Italy uh, came uh, up with a memorandum of understanding with the Chinese side, and Washington was very fast to, to uh, warn them from, from going too far along this uh, road, down this road. So. Um, I also realized that Japan actually made a memorandum of, of understanding in Beijing, October uh, 2018, to have a more systematic cooperation with the Chinese side in this respect. But I also do believe that we already now see some important strains, uh, some difficulties in implementing this agreement, and I don't think it's going very far, uh, to be honest. Uh, so I think my point here is that being one of Washington's main partners, um, I think that uh, I would expect the Japanese government to be very susceptible to U.S. pressure on all these issues, especially uh, Huawei, technological rivalry, uh, Belt and Road Initiative and all that. So I'm just interested in how this deepening rivalry will affect Sino-Japanese relations and will Japan's proactive um, 
participation uh, in the court, uh, you know, the strategic uh, cooperation uh, among Japan, Australia, India, and U.S. affect Chinese-Japanese relations? Will its patrols in the South China Sea affect uh, the relationship? Will uh, the recent uh, decision to to transform your helicopter carriers to aircraft carriers affect it? And so on and so on. I think there are so many points to make here. Um, so. Yeah, does the Japanese government see the t deterioration of U.S.-Chinese relations primarily as a strategic opportunity that strengthens Tokyo's strategic position? Or does it fear to be drawn into this antagonistic great power rivalry that may spiral out of control? That would actually be my final question. So that would conclude my comments. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you very much for some very thoughtful reflections and uh, good questions and I think uh, also some of them quite difficult to respond <laughs> to. But anyway, you will have the chance. I just want to make an advertisement that we have a, we have a, a seminar on the 24th of April on the Belt and Road Initiative and uh, Japan's uh, response to it. Uh, anyway, Professor Nishino, would you, would you like to uh, uh, yes, uh, respond uh, to your uh, questions, please? Yes, sir. Okay. If you want to ask questions, please uh, notify me. Hmm. So thank you for the very insightful comment and uh, good and difficult questions. Uh, I try to make my, my answer shorter. Uh, the first one is about the regarding the uh, the my I would say tentative assessment uh, the the outcome of second summit meeting between the Trump and Kim in Hanoi. Uh, uh, I would say that it's too early to uh, assess all over the uh, so what's real, what happened in in the summit meeting. So because there are many stories, right? Just after the summit meeting, Trump the uh, the mentioned very the strong words uh, the, in his news conference. But uh, just after the Trump's uh, news conference. North Korean side, Foreign Minister Lee Yong ho and the Vice Minister Che song uh protest Trump's news conference. And then this uh, representative vegan uh, made another story in the Philippines. And also the security advisor Bolton uh, made a different statement with the uh, interview uh, with the US media outlet. So now we have many different stories. But uh, I would say that uh, obviously the uh, main issue and uh, important uh, component of the second summit meeting was the definition of denuclearization, as I mentioned earlier. Because from the uh, Chairman Kim's perspective, Kim thought that uh, it's enough to submit the major facilities in Yongbyon, I mean the old nuclear reactor, uh, plutonium processing facilities, and uranium enrichment facilities. The Kim thought that these three are the core, important, core component of denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. But Trump and maybe Bolton uh, did not think so from their perspective the core component of denuclearization is not only Yonbyon facilities, but also any other facilities. By the way, the Sifan Vegan mentioned in the Philippines that there are more than 300 facilities in Yonbyon. And the Bolton also mentioned that the uh, uh, denuclear concept of denuclearization should uh, include not only denuclearized denuclearizing the nuclear program, but also uh, should include the all of weapons of mass destruction, biological and the chemical one. So obviously, the, there are very wide gap be between Kim and Trump on the concept of the denuclearization. So this, uh, the, the, this uh, the very wide gap uh, made it impossible for them to reach agreement. This is a very important aspect of second summit meeting from my perspective. 
And actually, the another one, another important thing uh, is that U.S. domestic politics. I will say that. The, I will say that, uh, yes, I think it's true that uh, uh, the, the congressional hearing, the hearing of the, the former Trump, the important advisor, Mr. Cohen's hearing in, in Congress, U.S. Congress, uh, might give some negative impact to the Hanoi summit meeting. And uh, this hearing uh, might change Trump's mindset in Hanoi summit meeting. But uh, again, it's too early to assess this kind of aspect. The question number two, uh, I think the, maybe the Chairman Kim's intention to denuclearize North Korea. Uh, I don't want to say that North Korea never abandoned nuclear capabilities because now uh, we are making very serious effort to denuclearize North Korea. It's quite difficult. But anyway, now we are still uh, making our joint effort uh, to tackle North Korea's nuclear and missile program. But yes, uh, it's true. Uh, anyway, it's quite difficult for us to denuclearize, to realize denuclearization uh, of North Korea. Uh, but so as you mentioned, the important aspect of the, this negotiation uh, between the U.S. and North Korea is uh, not only denuclearization, but also, as you mentioned, security guarantees which U.S. and North Korea uh, agreed in the Singapore summit meeting last June. So then, what's the security guarantees for North Korea? So you mentioned the, I think the nuclear capability, possessing a nuclear, nuclear capability is a very important security guarantee for North Korea at this point. But I think that uh, possessing a nuclear capability is not enough for Kim. <coughs> Because at this point, his most important policy is to reboost his nation's economy, economic development. Then not only, not only military aspect, but also economic accept, aspect, as well as the political aspect, are also important for him to realize security guarantee. The from economic aspect, obviously the uh, Kim needs uh, lifting economic sanction, and also he needs to the favorable environment, which contribute to reboost his nation's economy. And politically, uh, obviously he wants to set a new relationship with the United States. Final destination is to normalize or establish this diplomatic relationship with the United States. So if our side, U.S. and the international community uh, give this kind of component of security guarantees to North Korea, we may see the denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. Yes, it's a wrong process, but uh, and uh, yes, at this point, the, as I mentioned, the Kim's intention is unclear, becoming unclear now. But uh, anyway, the result, the results should be defined and uh, uh, decided by the interaction between U U North Korea and the international community. So let's see what happens next. And uh, uh, finally, the uh, actually I. I a bit missed uh, the, your question regarding the Abe's policy. Abe's policy uh, towards North Korea. Yes, uh, I would say that uh, at this point, the J Japanese government is quite well, uh, keep, keeping quite well coordination with the United States. Yes, uh, uh, frankly speaking, my personal perspective, uh, we also have a difficulty uh, in dealing with the so-called Trump's uh, unpredictability, unpredictability, uncertainty. Uh, in all of the policy arena. But uh, our alliance management with the United States is very well organized past 50 or 60 years. Then, then yes, uh, obviously the Trump's uh, the unpredictability is a kind of Trump risk for the Japanese government. 
I will say, that uh, it, it's possible for us to manage this kind of risk through the, our uh, robust uh, alliance coordination. This is my tentative answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. So please give us a comment. Yes. Right. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, every question is very difficult to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you gave me uh, two questions. One is on the Senkaku issues. The other is this uh, economic cooperation with, uh, between two countries. And first of all, the Senkaku issues. So from Japanese point of view, Senkaku issues at the start, starting point is the 2008. So as uh, in my presentation, I mentioned that 2008 consensus. Mm -hmm. That consensus is the when President Fujita visited Japan and discussed with our pre, uh, prime minister and next month to countries to announce the 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 the, 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 the con uh, it's, uh, agreement to on the joint development between Japan and China mm -hmm. in the East China Sea. Mm -hmm. At that time, every all of the Japanese people think, oh, on the problems of the Senkaku issue or completely resolved. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, to in December 2008, China's Coast Guard started to include my, our territorial issue, our territorial water. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so to be honest, from Japanese point of view, really, really supplies. Why China do that? That is the most, from Japanese point of view, most important things. Mm -hmm. So if we discuss on the, this Senkaku issue, Senkaku DOE issue, we have to pay attention to 2008 consensus. So Japanese government, today Japanese government also recognize there are this consensus in between two countries. So from the Japanese government try to work this agreement and, and we are trying to management and control on the East China Sea order. So that is my answer. The second one is the economic issues. In my presentation, in my presentation also mentioned that two countries' economic relations is, is very important each other. And in May last year, Premier Li Kachan visited Japan and our countries exchange the, 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 the it's a joint it's a uh, it's a uh, I, I forgot the name joint memorandum mm -hmm. of the the economic cooperation toward the third countries. So, of course, in, in, in this um, document, they did not include the phrase BRI and, and free and open in the Pacific, this world. The Belt and Road Initiative is Chinese side want to put in this document. Mm -hmm. But the Japanese side also want to put in this document. But finally, in this memorandum, there is no two phrase. <coughs> that is the it's kind of it's it's a Japan and China put together their mm -hmm. wisdom to deepen uh, 
uh, economic relations and avoid confliction mm -hmm. of the political phase and security issue. That is the, our, it's our position, also China's position. So currently, our uh, China and Japan's, uh, Japan and China's relations, there are two dimensions. One is economic, the more and the deeper, try to get deeper. And political, uh, political and security issues try to manage this, our, our conflict. Mm -hmm. mm, that is my, 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 my answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. The, the, so the, actually, the uh, changing status quo of Senkaku is a very famous uh, issue uh, between the Japan and China. So the, when I attend the international conference with my Chinese uh, colleagues, we uh, always discuss about this issue, but uh, we have yet to uh, see the narrowing gap between the <laughs> <laughs> I and uh, my Chinese counterpart. The from the Jap the uh, the actually the the your interpretation is from my perspective or from Japanese perspective is the Chinese side story, mm -hmm. uh, but from Japanese uh, there are, there is a Japanese side story. Uh, the Japanese side of the story is that uh, actually the, at that time, uh, 2012, uh, DPJ government, uh, Democratic uh, Party of Japan government, uh, was trying to keep status quo of Senkaku by, how can I say, uh, in a way, in changing the ownership to private owner to uh, the government owner, because at that time uh, another uh, player, uh, for the governor of Tokyo Metropolitan Government, uh, Shintaro Ichihara, tried to purchase Senkaku Island in a way to uh, to take a kind of countermeasure against China. He's a he's a very famous very famous focus. Uh, position and he wants to show very strong uh, position uh, towards China. So the Ishihara trying to try to do, to do so. Then Japanese government thought that uh, uh, it's unappropriate. It's, um, it's not. It, it's not right thing. Then uh, Japanese government uh, try to instead try to uh, the in a way purchase or the change the ownership. At that time, the Senkaku was uh, owned by the, the, the private uh, person. But uh, then, in a way, from my perspective, the situation was uh, very unstable. Then Japanese government tried to uh, make more stable situation by the changing the ownership. But from Chinese perspective, uh, this Japanese action uh, was a kind of the changing the status quo. So the, the, these are, there are very different stories uh, the, with regard to Senkaku Island conflict. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your responses. I think we should open the floor for comments or questions. And I think we could include them there. And then also if anybody wants to comment um, on what you <laughs> said. Uh, Those so are the experts. Uh, okay. uh, yes, Pedro, please. And please introduce yourself. Yes, yes. Uh, I would like uh, to ask you, two gentlemen, uh, I listen to your presentations with great interest, uh, but uh, I would like to know a little bit more how you look at uh, China. Uh, well, we have, you discussed specifically uh, the United States feeling about uh, China for the time being. And, uh, and you have this warm relationship but there are two things, I guess, uh, which is new. And this is, of course, uh, that uh, the Chinese military forces are, well, 6% uh, as normally uh, uh, in, in uh, a race in, in, uh, in, in the budget. That is normal, but, uh, but still you have this uh, feeling that uh, the uh, forces in, uh, in, in China 
very strong, very new in, in many ways, uh, very sophisticated. And the other way uh, I would ask you is uh, the new uh, feeling that uh, China has gained in what you call uh, the uh, in soft power. This is at least what the United States would say all the time. And they tell about make one report after another that uh, China has an, a direct impact upon uh, different countries, uh, also domestic policy. Yes, please. Uh, who, who would wish to answer the first question? Or do you both have comments to that? China's militarization. <coughs> so Japan's effort or Japan's response? Yeah, I, I do like a look at what some will, will call the uh, militarization of uh, China. Uh, you, you see the, the, the military forces are getting bigger and bigger and uh, you still have this problem with uh, that you are, of course, have uh, very good uh, armed forces but not uh, using the same uh, part of the budget mm -hmm. for military forces. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, yes, uh, the, as, as you uh, well know, the, the there has been a growing concern in Japan about China's uh, rise of China, not only economically, but also politically and militarily. Uh, so in dealing with China, especially the military, uh, the, in a way, how can I say, uh, I would say assertiveness, if the, the, frankly speaking. Uh, so Japan is trying to uh, make efforts, with, from my perspective, in, in, the, in three aspects. One is, uh, uh, the enhancing our own defense capability, and the number two, uh, the fostering the fostering more our alliance uh, partnership and the coordination with the United States, and uh, the final one is the uh, final one is uh, recently the very uh, the important having very important aspect, which is the the Quad concept. What means four, four countries' cooperation: Japan, United States, India, and and also Australia. Australia. Uh, so, which the share the in the same values such as democracy, free market. Uh, yes, the Japanese government, uh, from my perspective, is trying to the foster uh, this kind of the, the effort in dealing with China's uh, military. Uh, Activity, but uh, at the same time, I would say that uh, as, as Professor Kamo mentioned, actually the, the our relationship with China, Japan's relationship with China, is very complicated, and uh, and uh, also have many aspects, not only military, but also we have a very important partner as a political, as, as a, uh, the economic and the trade uh, aspect, and also important as a political aspect. Then, the, as Professor Kamo mentioned, the the uh, the Japanese Prime Minister Abe uh, visited Beijing in last September and agreed with Xi Jinping to try to foster the joint uh, economic uh, joint economic project, especially in South country. Uh, so the, on the one hand, uh, we have to uh, prepare, very prepared to deal with the militarized China, but at the same time, we have to co cooperate more with the China's uh, Chinese economy. So the, our relationship is uh, really complicated. Do you have any comments? Yeah. We still have one question outstanding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Soft power. A soft power. <laughs> yeah. But if you want to comment on the first question. Yes, yes, the first comment. Yeah. So we can, how can I say, our foreign policy towards China is the continuously engagement policy and the economic issues we try to more and more cooperate with China. Uh, but for it, uh, especially military issues, security issues, so we are watching and management, managing the two, two countries. So also we can, we can say it's try to keep the contact and to try to keep the discuss and try to keep, uh, give some our concern 
deliver to the Beijing. That is our it's a basic uh, foreign policy towards China. So we have to keep contact with China. That is my answer. Okay, the, the second question about uh, Chinese influence, as you said, um, there have been a lot of reports about that in Australia, in New Zealand, in the US. Uh, so is that an issue in Japan at all? Yeah, of course, there are. So, mm -hmm. for example, uh, Confucius Institution issue. Mm -hmm. So many academic fields, <coughs> there are some arguments. And some professors concerned about the, 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 the worry about the academic field in Japan. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, we have it's fruitful experience it's because we are neighbor, <laughs> Chinese neighbor, neighboring country. <coughs> so we know China's public diplomacy. And but at the same time, we are, we are bo at the same time, China is the, our important and good partner in Asia. So also this is also <laughs> managing, how to manage to, to, to the academic cooperation and relationship to country. <laughs> so yeah, that is my basic answer. Okay, thank you. So uh, please, uh, your turn. Yeah. please present yourself. Uh, my name is Stefan Goethe. I'm from an organization called Global Seniors in Denmark. And um, uh, I, now I understand there is a seminar coming in the month's time about the President Roach initiative. But maybe we could take advantage of, of Professor Kamo's uh, presence mm -hmm. to hear just, just a few words about what is Japan's actual uh, current involvement in the BRA. And, and, and how is the initiative perceived in Japan? Is it, is it important? Is it, is it in fact a very important vehicle for the global development that Japan has to jump onto? Okay. Or is it a minor thing? <laughs> <laughs> so, economic relations between two countries is very important for us. And BRI is the China's, it's kind of the foreign policy. So from Japanese point of view, China is important economic partner for us, but we don't need show the <coughs> agree with the China's position. But at the same time, in my presentation, I mentioned that we already it's, uh, exchanged a memorandum, the, the, the other countries economic <coughs> cooperation to countries. So from this point of view, our government have never mentioned support BRI, but we know the China's economic power and influence. So we uh, try to keep with the China's economy and we need, to, we are, we are look, looking for the, the cooperation, economic cooperation with China. For example, in the, 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 the East Asia countries, the point of view, they want to see the conflict with two countries between and China. One of my friends, he is the Singaporean. He usually said to me, told me, uh, when we are going to coffee shop, in the menu, only two choices. One is the Japanese tea and Chinese tea. But from Singaporean point of view, we cannot choose one. We need mixed with Japanese tea <laughs> and Chinese tea. That is the, the East Asian country's point of view. And 
from Japanese point of view, East Asian countries is very important market, and China's point of view also very important market, ASEAN country. So from this point of view, Japan and China also already have a good cooperation in, in, in the economic area. Mm -hmm. So so how can I say? My answer is the our countries have never said support with the BRI, but our economic uh, cooperation with China is we know our government knows that uh, China is most important economic partner of us. That is my answer. So I, I'm not familiar with the Chinese for chi China's foreign <coughs> policy, but uh, from my perspective, the important thing is only one. What is the goal of Belt and the Road Initiative? If China uh, try to create new order led by the China's value and uh, concept through the BRI uh, Belt and Road Initiative. So in this case, I will say that Japan cannot accept this kind of the initiative. Because the, from Japanese perspective, uh, we want to sustain existing liberal international uh, order, and we want to the develop uh, this order. Uh, but if China uh, want to the foster and sustain uh, the, the existing uh, liberal international order through the BRI, the BRI initiative, then uh, it's okay for Japan, and uh, we can uh, cooperate with China. Uh, so the, this is, uh, I think, the, the most important uh, point the about the support or non-support mm -hmm. for the BRI. By, by the way, the Japan is now the fostering the another concept, <laughs> free and open in the Pacific, <laughs> uh, the, which try to fo the disseminate the importance of rule of law and uh, <coughs> connectivity for these kind of things. Uh, and the, frankly speaking, I would say that uh, this uh, free and op free and open in the Pacific, uh, we, we we often say hoip, hoip concept hoip Hope concept is, uh, from my perspective, was originally uh, was, was originally uh, in a way counter China strategy, especially under the first Abe administration. But now the Japanese government changed the position. Uh, they at the first uh, at the very first phase, the Japanese government sometimes used the word strategy, hope strategy. But now the, the Japanese government uh, doesn't use the word strategy, just a vision. Uh, the important, uh, additional important uh, component of hope is the inclusiveness. Uh, the, if China uh, really uh, try to uh, jointly make efforts to sustain and foster existing uh, the order, then the, uh, from Japanese, perspective, Japanese government perspective, the, we can uh, we can make a joint effort to foster the and develop this infrastructure, not only in the Asia, East Asia, but also the, the South, China, South Asia and the African continent. But well, so re let's see the how China's uh, response to our proposal. Okay, thank you very much. I think we're getting close to the end of the afternoon. So one final question from you. Please present yourself. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor. I really appreciate your uh, different uh, perspectives to analyze this issue. And uh, I'm the name, please. Uh, okay. I'm Bill, an exchange student here from China and uh, in the Department of Political Science. And I uh, really uh, support the idea that the Camel Professor just uh, uh, professed proposed that uh, China and Japan have many economic cooperation in the BRI. And more, uh, uh, another case to support that is the uh, Asian infrastructure investment uh, bank because at the beginning with the uh, effect of the United States 
the Japan don't want to join it and join in that. But after uh, a period of time, that the Japan Japanese government see the many benefits among this bank, so Japan uh, shift its attitude and uh, join in it. And that is uh, uh, another case. And my question is that since uh, Donald Trump has become the president of the United States, and uh, the Trump uh, changes uh, many of its policy orientation towards East Asia. The first one is that uh, Donald Trump uh, proposes that uh, Korea and Japan should be responsible for their uh, security protection and uh, pay for the security protection manipulated by the United States. So, and the second one is that the President Donald Trump more like are uh, more likely to solve the many disputes and the issues in the East uh, Asia through a bilateral um, for forum rather than mm, multi multilateral forum that uh, the United States used uh, to be. So, what's the uh, Japan's attitude and the Japanese government's attitude towards this kind of policy orientation? Because I think on the one hand that. Uh, Japanese government are really uh, glad to see this action because with uh, the advanced economy and the technology, J J Japan can develop the nuclear weapon no more than half a year, so that's a good thing. But on the other hand, that the Japanese government has to uh, burden a lot of security issues from the pressure of the North Korea and other neighboring countries, so what is the Japanese government's attitude towards the kind of changes of the policy orientation? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. So, <coughs> yes, as you said, Japan is uh, currently facing a difficult international problems, but from Japanese point of view, <coughs> answer is very simple. So we are a member of the liberal international community. So from Japanese point of view, what is the most important things for <coughs> Japan's national interest? It's the keep the the, the the liberal democratic international community. So from this point of view, Japan is the one of the United States allies, but same time we have to keep Washington to some our concern and at the same time we are we want to understand China's what kind of the global governance China want to create because China China's leadership repeatedly to say uh, mention that we want to to create and uh, develop the uh, global governance. But that is, to be honest, it's welcome for us. But we are still not clear what kind of the global governance China want to create. Still not clear. So we, are, we want to understand and we want to give uh, we want to see more detail the China's the views on the global governance. That is our, uh, it's, uh, maybe I'm not sure, but our government position towards a uh, position. Is that okay? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to both of you and to Andreas uh, for your very enlightened uh, talks and uh, comments, answers to questions. Thank you very much.